Hi everyone, welcome to another video in my Stockholders Equity Lecture Series. This video is all about dividends. Um, and so uh, dividends is essentially when we're not issuing stock, we're not buying back our stock, but we're simply giving something back to our existing shareholders. That's what we call a dividend. So let's take a look at what's involved with dividends and how do we account for them. All right, first our overview. Um, dividends are distributions to stockholders, as we know, based on, and they can be based on different things. Um, percentage of ownership is one thing they might be based on. That's typically what you see with common stock. So the company decides it's gonna give back a certain amount of money and there's a certain number of shares out there. And so every share gets its proportional share of that money. And the more shares you own, the more money you get, right? That's, that's kind of what I'm talking about with that first bullet. The percent of your ownership determines the percent of the dividend that you receive. However, um, whereas common stock is all based on just how much do you own and therefore what's your cut of the pie, Preferred stock um, gets, again, I say here a guaranteed amount, and really I should be saying, I guess, a fixed amount. Um, preferred stock, by definition, has debt characteristics. Um, and one of those debt characteristics is that the, the dividend is essentially already determined. And so it's supposed to get a periodic payment of that dividend, um, rather than some proportional cut of, of a certain pie. Um, I say down here, the distribution, might be in cash, it might be in stock, it might be in PP&E, it might be in other assets. Um, and that's all true, but let's keep it simple for this class. Um, we're gonna deal with cash and stock, and mainly cash, but I will show you how stock dividends work. Um, and that's how most dividends are. Most dividends are simply the company says, look, we've, we've, we've got a lot of retained earnings, we're gonna give something back um, to, to the shareholders, let's, let's throw uh, some cash their way. That's how most of them are. Some companies may not want to give up the cash, so they, they just issue more stock to the existing shareholders. And then, of course, as I said, you do have these other situations where you could give a dividend in the form of an, a fixed asset or, or just some other asset. It doesn't have to be cash or stock. It could just be something of value. But that's much more rare, and we're not really even going to talk about it. Just wanting you to know it, the possibilities there. Um, and dividends, as far as how we see them in, say, practice problems, and I say practice problems, it's real life, how, what we're mimicking, but you're going to see common phrases um, that dividends are expressed in, such as there may be a dividend of a certain dollar per share, or um, uh, a certain number of shares, or a percent of the par value may be the dividend, or a percent of shares outstanding. So uh, these first two are, are kind of your kind of your cash um, dividend expressions, uh, dollars per share or percent of par value, assuming the stock has a par value, we're going to give back $2 per share, or we're going to give a dividend of 10% of par value or something of that nature. You're talking money, right? Whereas these two on the right here, those are more talking about your stock dividends. We're going to give a dividend of this many shares, or we're going to give a 10% uh, stock dividend, increase the number of shares in the market by 10%, right? So these are just common phrases that you might see, ways that dividends are worded. Don't get thrown off just because you see it worded different ways. Um, uh, just ask yourself, what's being given away? That's the dividend. All right, so when it comes to dividends, we got to talk about the three Ds, the three dates. Um, and, and these are the declaration date, the date of record, and the distribution date. Those three dates determine the entire, call it accounting life cycle of a dividend. Um, the declaration date is the day that the company actually comes out and says, we're going to pay a dividend, okay? So they receive approval from the board of directors to give a dividend back, they go out, they announce it. By the act of them announcing that dividend, they have created an obligation to pay the dividend. What's an obligation? Well, it's a liability, right? And so um, on that day, they're gonna reduce retained earnings. Now you might be saying, wait, why are you reducing retained earnings? Well, this harkens all the way back to when we talked about retained earnings and how it's calculated. And um, just as a reminder, beginning retained earnings plus any new net income minus any dividends equals ending retained earnings. 
And that's where the reduction of retained earnings comes in. The day you declare a dividend, you take that dividend out of the retained earnings. That's where that minus dividend comes from in the retained earnings calculation. And so uh, you reduce retained earnings by the amount of the dividend, whatever value it has. If it's a cash dividend, you put a liability on your books. That liability is called dividend payable. And just like every other payable, it's just, hey, we owe this, right? We owe cash to somebody and we have to pay it. Um, if it's an equity dividend, um, a, 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 a stock dividend, will you? You put what, what I'm calling here, this isn't official terminology, but what I'm calling here an equity obligation on your balance sheet. Um, we call this stock dividend distributable distributable. Um, why am I calling it an, an equity obligation versus a liability, right? We just said the other one is a liability, dividend payable, liability. Well, it's because this one right here, stock dividend distributable, it does not go on your balance sheet as a liability. It actually goes in the equity section of your balance sheet. And the reason for that is this. Remember, a, a liability is an obligation to essentially give up an asset in the future. Um, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's loss of value. Well, it, it's the result of loss of value, I, I should say. You incur a cost, you haven't paid for it yet, you agree, hey, I'm gonna give you the asset later. That's, that's a liability. When it comes to um, a stock dividend, you're not agreeing to give up any asset. That's part of the reason companies use stock dividends. They don't want to part ways with their cash, right? When you give a stock dividend, all you're saying is, I'm going to give you some more ownership. And so you don't really have a liability because you're not giving up an asset in the future. And so it doesn't get recorded as a liability. It just sits in your equity section of your balance sheet as a promise to give out more equity later. Okay, So that's why I call it an equity obligation versus like a, a true obligation. All right, so that's the names that you're going to see, though, um, when it comes to journal entries. Dividend payable, stock dividend distributable. Obviously, the, the reduction is retained earnings. All right, that's what happens on declaration date. Date of record is actually not an important date for accounting purposes. This is just a real-world date. Um, what happens is when companies come out and declare dividends, they say, we will pay a dividend of, insert amount here, to shareholders of record on, insert date here. Um, that that date that follows two shareholders of record on this day, that's what's called the date of record. And basically all that, all that date of record means is that any investor that still has the stock on that day is going to get the dividend. Any investor that gets rid of the stock before that day won't get the dividend. Um, and, and so that's just kind of a real life thing. That, that's a real world thing, telling investors, you want the dividend, hold the stock through this day. You don't want the dividend, get rid of the stock before this day. But from a company standpoint, nothing economic has happened, right? Um, you haven't done anything more than declare the dividend, which you've already journalized down here. And so the date of record is meaningless. Um, the third D is the distribution date. This is when the company actually pays out the dividend. And so what happens that day? Well, it's the same thing that happens anytime you fulfill an obligation. Um, the obligation goes away. So whether that's the liability created by the cash dividend or the equity obligation created by the stock dividend, these two accounts down here, um, they get debited, they go away. And instead, um, you, you credit cash if you're paying off the cash dividend or you credit stock you're giving out if you're if you're paying off a, a stock dividend. Um, and so that's the distribution date. So that's your three Ds. Remember, date of record, no accounting there, just knowledge. Um, but declaration date creates an obligation, distribution date pays off an obligation. If you remember those key things, you can handle accounting for dividends. All right, let's start with the simplest of simple as far as examples go, a cash dividend on common stock. Um, on March 23rd, Flyer Corps declares a cash dividend of 10 cents per share on outstanding stock of 200,000 shares. The date of record is March 31st. The distribution date is April 30th. Record the journal entries for the cash dividend. So first thing you should do when you see a problem like this, find that date of record, put a line through it to make sure you don't record something you're not supposed to record. Date of record is irrelevant. But what we do have is we have March 23rd. 
where we're going to declare the dividend, and we have April 30th, where we're going to pay out the dividend, and it's 10 cents per share on 200,000 shares. Well, 200,000 times 10 cents equals 20,000. That is the total value of the dividend. And therefore, on the day that we announce it, the day we declare we will pay that dividend, you go ahead and reduce retained earnings. Remember, retained earnings is an equity account. It normally has a credit balance. So to reduce it, we debit it. And you take that 20,000 out of retained earnings. Why are you taking that 20,000 out? Well, because you owe cash to somebody, dividend payable for $20,000. By the way, you might see this referred to as cash dividend payable. You don't need to put the cash in front of it, um, but but sometimes you'll see it taught that way just as a reminder, hey, you only use this when you're dealing with cash, not stock, right? But up to you whether you put cash dividend payable or dividend payable. Either way, we're, we're talking about cash. Um, so that's what happens on declaration date. On payment date, we just pay the obligation. The dividend payable goes away, 20,000, and cash gets paid out, 20,000. And that's all there is to it. So like I said, the simplest of simple. When you have a cash dividend on common stock, it's just this easy. There's, there's really no tricks here. But it does get more complicated, right? It can't just always be that simple because, well, we have more than just common stock, don't we? We have preferred stock. So um, what's the difference between common stock and preferred stock when it comes to dividends? Well, first of all, um, typically preferred stockholders are gonna get paid first. So if the company has a certain pool of money they're willing to give out, um, they got to make sure that the preferred shareholders get their due, whatever whatever fixed payment they're required to have. They got to make sure that that's paid before then they can give the leftovers to the common shareholders. Um, preferred dividends are often what we call cumulative as well. Remember, preferred stock often has like a, a fixed rate that says, here's the dividend that gets paid. And Companies, however, um, they choose whether to pay a dividend or not, right? Now, companies, it, it tends to be what we call sticky. Um, if you don't pay a dividend, you typically never start. If you do pay a dividend, you typically don't quit. Um, and the main reason for that is because any move you make that changes the norm, the expectation, is taken as a signal of something happened, right? If you never used to pay a dividend and suddenly you are, investors might call into question, well, why are you giving the money back? Do you not have enough good ideas to invest it in yourself to retain that earning like you've always done and put it back in operations? If you currently give a dividend and then you stop, investors are going to be like, well, why are you stopping? Can you not afford to give this dividend? Is your financial situation getting worse? So no matter what, companies can't win if they change. And, and so it typically is that companies that never pay a dividend just continue to never do it. Companies that pay one just continue to pay one. Um, with that said, um, companies can opt, even companies that regularly pay dividends, companies can opt to not pay a dividend any year they want, right? That's their choice, whether they pay a dividend or not. And so with preferred dividends, um, if your preferred dividends are not cumulative and a company decides to skip a year, you're just out of luck. You don't get that payment that year. If your preferred dividends are cumulative, um, then basically, even if the company chooses not to pay a dividend in a given year, uh, they still owe it to the preferred stakeholders. And so they just basically rack up a debt of dividends um, over however many years they choose not to pay. And of course, once the company does declare a dividend again, uh, it's got to go and pay all, the, the, all, all, all that back pay, what we call dividends and arrears. It's got to go back and make all that up to the preferred shareholders. And so this could put you in a real bind. If you're a common stockholder and you're waiting for a dividend, um, if, if there's some uh, basically uh, debt to preferred shareholders building up on the back burner, you may not see a dividend for a long time. And so that's the idea of cumulative versus versus non-cumulative. Um, non-cumulative, company skips a year, preferred shareholders out of luck. Cumulative, preferred shareholders are still owed that dividend even if the company chose not to pay it that year, chooses to pay it later. All right, and again, um, as I kind of keep mentioning, if there is any money left for dividends after the preferred shareholders are paid, that remainder will then go to the common shareholders. All right, so let's see it as an example. So first up, 
cash dividend, preferred stock this time in a cumulative setting. Um, assume Flyercore has 100,000 shares of 5% $2 par value preferred stock outstanding. Um, notice here, I've introduced a new piece into the mix. I've introduced 5%. Where the heck did that come from? We've never talked about that. We talk about number of shares. We talk about par value. We've never talked about a percent. That's the fixed dividend that you'll see on preferred stock sometimes. It's expressed as a percent of par value. Um, and so what this is just saying is that um, every period, uh, this stock is supposed to get 5% of $2. Every share of it gets 5% of $2. All right, so um, assume they have that. Dividends are cumulative, so I'm gonna go ahead and underline that so we, so we don't miss it, but have not been paid in four years. I'm gonna underline that too, because that's gonna be very important. On December 31st of year five, Flyer Corps declares a cash dividend of 67,500. So basically the company said, here's the money we can give back, 67,500. Let's go ahead and disperse that to the shareholders. The date of record is January 31st. The distribution date is February 15th. Remember, date of record from accounting standpoint, we don't care. Scratch that one out. Record the journal entries for the cash dividend and note how much of the distribution is gonna to go to the preferred shareholders versus the common shareholders. Um, so first of all, when we deal with journal entries, there's no real concept of who the money goes to. There's just dividend payable, right? It doesn't matter who you're paying. You just have a payable from an accounting standpoint. Um, and that's why there's the kind of the end piece of this problem where I say, figure out who gets what, because you're not gonna see that in the journal entry. Um, it was December 31st of year five that Flyer Corps declared the dividend, 67,500. So reduce retained earnings, 67,500. It's a cash dividend, so record dividend payable, 67,500. And then they're going to distribute this on February 15th. So 215, the dividend payable goes away. 67,500, and the cash is paid out. 67,500. This part is nothing new. This is what we did with the common stock. It stays the same for preferred stock from a journal entry standpoint. So nothing harder there. The question is, well, what else happens then? Um, when we say, well, who does the cash go to? Because that's the real question in this problem. How much cash do the preferred shareholders get? How much cash do the common shareholders get in this particular situation? Well, remember what I said earlier about this 5%. Um, the, these shares of preferred stock get 5% of $2, guaranteed dividend, basically. Um, and so if we do a little math on that, uh, we've got $2 times 5%, that's, that's how much dividend each share gets, and there are 100,000 shares. So uh, let's see, we've got $2 times 0 0.05 times 100,000 gives us a total of $10,000. That $10,000 is the um, annual dividend. I say periodic dividend, but here, you know, we're talking in terms of years, right? Dividends have not been paid in four years. That is now year five. So we're really talking about annual is our period. So they're, they're entitled to a $10,000 annual dividend. That dividend has not been paid out in four years. And we've now hit the end of year five, which means the preferred shareholders are going to get $10,000 but they're gonna get five years worth of that $10,000. The four years dividends in arrears plus the current year, year five, which means 50,000 of that 67,500 is gonna to go to the preferred shareholders. The common shareholders simply get the leftovers. So 50,000 goes to preferred, 17,500 goes to common. And this is it, that, that's how you figure that out, okay? And, and so that kind of shows you the danger of, you know, if you're a common shareholder and you like dividends, you gotta kind of keep your eye out on, is there preferred stock out there? Is it cumulative? Are they gonna constantly have priority and there's not gonna be much left to give to me? These are things you have to ask yourself. Now, this was the cumulative scenario. What if, same exact problem, 
What if, in this case, not cumulative? Same problem, just not cumulative. Well, the journal entry isn't going to change. The, this journal entry is generic, right? There's no essence in this journal entry of cumulative, non-cumulative, preferred, common. The journal entry is simply, what obligation did you create? What obligation did you pay off? And that will stay the same. The only thing that will differ is how the 67500 gets distributed. And so I'm going to copy this real quick, take our old distribution, and I'm going to put it on this slide. Now, the only difference now is uh, it's non-cumulative preferred stock. Well, if it's non-cumulative, what that means is that this four years that hasn't been paid, oh well, preferred shareholders are simply out of luck. It's year five, a dividend is declared, and so preferred shareholders are gonna get $10,000, their annual dividend, what they're entitled to for year five, nothing more. Well, that also means that then the common shareholders, since the preferreds aren't getting nearly as much, the common shareholders are going to get a heck of a lot more, right? Fifty-seven thousand five hundred, um, and and that shows you the power of cumulative versus non-cumulative. It, it shows you it really does dictate how much may or may not be available for your common shareholders, whether or not you you rack up that that backlog of debt to the preferred shareholders or not as the years pass. All right, so that's cash dividends. Let's talk stock dividends for a moment. Um, what's the difference between them? Well, the biggest difference is just whether or not a company has to pay cash, right? In a cash dividend, you create an obligation for yourself that must be satisfied in cash, and therefore you're going to give up cash. Some companies like to hold on to their cash. We've, we've talked about cash numerous times about how important it is that you can't run a business without it. I have a whole topic dedicated to cash um, that you've probably already seen if you're this far along in the course. And so um, companies may not want to part with their cash. And so they may declare a stock dividend instead. They may say, we'll give you more stock instead of cash. Now, I do have to note the, the rules that I'm about to tell you here. Um, this only applies if the stock dividend is less than 25%. Any more than that, the accounting gets more complicated, and that is definitely out of scope for this course. So that would be covered in, in a more advanced financial accounting course than this. But for the smaller dividends, which are pretty much the most likely ones that are going to happen, um, what happens is, is the dividend obligation gets settled with stock, and as a result of that, um, both the stock and your additional paid in capital is going to go up. I'll talk about that in just a moment. You'll see how that happens because you might be saying, but nobody gave you any money. Why would additional paid in capital go up? You'll see how that plays out shortly because market price still matters in these stock distributions. Um, the composition of stockholders' equity will obviously change, right? If, if your stock number changes, if your additional paid in capital changes, then shareholders' equity has, has changed, the composition of it anyway total shareholders equity will not change. Why is that? Well, your stock is going up, your additional paid in capital is going up, but your retained earnings is going down for the same amount. And therefore those two negate each other and your total shareholders equity will be the same. Um, shares outstanding is in, going to increase by a certain percentage. That's basically what a stock dividend does. It says we're going to increase by 5%, 10%, whatever the case may be. Um, and of course, because this is simply a shuffling of shareholders' equity, there's no liability put on the books and there's no cash outflow. And that's the main benefit. That's the main thing that separates it from, say, a cash dividend. All right, let's see it in action. Um, on April 23rd, Flyercore declares a 10% stock dividend on outstanding stock of 200,000 shares. All right, before we go any further, let me just explain to you how to read that. You've got outstanding stock of 200,000 shares. The company is saying we will increase the number of shares in the market by 10%. So 200,000 shares times 10%, that's 20,000 new shares to be issued. Okay. Um, the par value of the stock is a dollar. That is going to matter because we have to record new stock. And if we're recording new stock, we have to know what the par value of that stock is in order to account for it correctly. The market value of the stock is $8.
The date of record is March 30th. We do not care about that. And the distribution date is May 31st. Record the journal entries for the stock dividend. All right, first up, um, April 23rd was the declaration date. April 23rd is the day we have to lower retained earnings. And we're going to record our obligation. But remember, this is not a liability. This is what I'm going to call an equity obligation. And, and we name that stock dividend distributable. It will just go into the shareholders' equity of the balance sheet. All right, so that's what we need to do. Now the question is, what numbers do we put here? How much are we actually giving investors? Well, we're giving them 20,000 shares of stock. And we know that that stock has a dollar par value. So as far as what that stock dividend distributable is going to be worth, well, it's worth $20,000, okay? Par value times the number of shares. But is that the total value of the dividend itself? And you may be saying, what's the difference in what you're asking? Well, there's a difference between the worth of the stock. Think of it in terms of the worth of the actual stock certificate based on par value, just like when we normally issue stock, and the value of the stock itself, the value of the ownership, the market value. You're giving investors 20,000 shares. Those 20,000 shares trade at eight bucks each. So the market value of this stock that you are giving investors, if we go 20,000 times $8 a piece, is, I believe, $160,000. All right, so this is market value of this dividend. That's the value that you're actually declaring. And so retained earnings goes down for that full 160,000 because that's what you're actually giving your investors. You're giving them $160,000 worth of value. But then the question becomes, well, wait a minute, but then why is the stock dividend distributable only 20,000? Well, because you're literally going to give them stock certificates, whether physically or digital. And those stock certificates are only worth their par value. But the difference between that par value and the actual value of the new ownership gets recorded to additional paid in capital. And uh, did it say if this was common? It didn't say common or preferred. We'll assume common. And that is 140,000, the excess. And so this is why APIC actually goes up in these transactions because yes, you are giving new ownership into the market. That new ownership has a market value, but you cannot account for that market value in the stock account. You can only account for the par value in the stock account. Now, of course, everything I'm saying hinges on you understanding what the next journal entry looks like. So let's go ahead and do that real quick because you're saying right now you might be looking at it going, but you only did this obligation thing, right? Isn't your obligation 160,000? It is, sure. But here's what's gonna happen next. Um, when we get to May 31st, we're gonna get rid of that obligation. So stock division distributable. Whoa, I misspelled that one bad. Distributable. Forgive my handwriting on that one. Instead of wasting your time, I'll just leave it. Um, we're going to get rid of that. And we are literally going to give the investors the stock. And of course, now you see why we could only record that obligation at 20000 Because when we hand them the stock, the stock itself is only worth par value, 20000 um, you might be saying, well, wait a minute, wouldn't it have made more sense to do this? Here, let me move APIC down here, right? And why don't we change the distributable to 160 because this is the, this is the obligation, right? And then make this 60 or 160, right? Wouldn't this make more sense? Uh, here is the, 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 the value of the obligation. And then when we issue the obligation, some of that goes to stock, some of it goes to APIC. And I would tell you, yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, I, I can't argue that, that what's written here right now totally makes sense. The thing is, whether you put this APIC in on the tail end or you put this APIC in right at the declaration point, 
it doesn't really make a difference. Um, remember, this distributable is, is being included as part of equity. APIC is part of equity. Um, the only reason that, that, that 20,000 of it is a distributable now, um, whereas the APIC uh, doesn't have to wait, is because the, the, the stock itself you're going to give to people at a later date. The APIC is yours and you already have it. And so I'm going to go ahead and hit undo real quick and put this back how it was because frankly, yep, there we go. Because frankly, this is more accurate. Even though the other way kind of makes more sense, this is more accurate. On the day you declare, you already have in your possession the APIC. So you may as well put it on the books on that day. The only thing left to give the investors is the stock certificate, which is valued at par value. And that's why we put that as the obligation. So this is the correct way to do it. Although I could see the argument of why the other way just logically probably makes more sense, but this is the way you, you should do it. And this is how stock dividends work. Um, so other than the fact that this is a little tricky to set up, um, there is nothing fancy about these problems either. That's kind of the, the name of the game when it comes to shareholders equity in general. A lot to talk about, um, um, lots of journal entries to memorize, but not anything super hard or super tricky. It's all pretty straightforward and a little bit of practice and you'll have it nailed. All right, so that's it for dividends. Remember the three Ds. Remember you can have cash dividends. Remember you have stock dividends. Remember both common and preferred stock can get dividends, but preferred has priority and has a fixed amount, whereas common stock kind of gets the leftovers. Keep all those things straight and, and you'll be golden as far as dividends go. Um, those are the bulk of our like primary uh, stock transactions. And so we've still got a couple of videos left. Um, one that is super short where I'll talk about stock splits. Um, and then a last one where we're going to talk about doing some analysis on our equity. Um, so hope you join me for those. Hope you found this one helpful and I hope you have a great day.